Welcome to the Space Dreamers Podcast, a Sue Madre production. There's your intro. Uh, <laughs> welcome to episode three of the Space Dreamers podcast. Um, my name is Jared Parisi. As always, I am your host. Today, I am with my guest co-host. Her name is Heather. Say hello, Heather. Hello. Um, real quick, before we get into all the uh, wonderful science fiction that we have to discuss, I want to do a quick shout out to my own Instagram. It's... Uh, so basically the show is on Instagram. Uh, it's the space dreamers at the space dreamers, T H E S P A C E D R E A M E R S. Uh, that's my Instagram. Go over there. You can see all the books that I'm reading. You can see behind the scenes footage of what it's like to make a, make a podcast. Um, I'm going to try to include other cool stuff on there just about sci-fi. Could people like make suggestions or like things they would want you to talk about? Absolutely. I was getting to that. Oh, so sorry. the best, okay. I don't have an, I don't have a website <laughs> yet. I don't have an email or anything. So if you want to get in touch with me, I'm, I'm just like a regular guy who likes sci-fi. Uh, you can go, go to that Instagram, the space streamers and like DM me and we can talk, we can have a discussion. And like, how does this sound? The first three people who I don't know to DM me on Instagram about this podcast and mention what I'm saying right now, you can be a guest on the show. Boom. Whoa. That's right. We'll do like a Zoom if you live super far away, which I mean you could live anywhere. Uh, we'll do like a Zoom and we'll just talk about whatever sci-fi you want to talk about. Uh, I'm serious about that. I want to make this show like weird and different and like I want to have like a, I want a, like not, to be super formulaic like i want obviously i have like a through line which is arthur c Clarke's books but we'll see what happens i don't know organic where like I'm, I'm just what happens yeah happens i'm recording episode three and literally <laughs> none of this has ever been shared with anyone outside people i know and i'm talking like people are gonna hear this so hopefully they do anyway um so today we're talking about the third novel by arthur c Clark and it's called Islands in the Sky. Now Heather, take this old ratty paperback. Okay. And and tell the people what it looks like. T- just talk about basically the cover. Okay. There is uh an astronaut and then a um an insect. So that's weird. I agree. I don't even remember yeah. the insect. <laughs> um I think the insect is my favorite part of that image and yet It's the only one that I don't really know where it fits into the book. I mean, this book looks very old. I think 70s, maybe? Moyer. Yeah, somebody named Moyer. I do love buying old books. What's up, Ding Dong? (laughs) Get down. (laughs) Sorry. It's all right. Um, Yeah, it looks very... I mean, it's cool, though, but it's exactly what you expect an old book to look like. Yeah. There's also like a planet and people are running on it. I think that's just like a circle with space behind oh, it. Oh, okay. And a rocket. So they're probably not running. They're probably floating. Yes. Oh, so, okay. They're doing an EVA. Okay. Do you know what EVA stands for? No. Some folks in a movie that we watched for this episode do EVAs. Well, I think that I wrote a, a thing about it. What is it? Tell me what it is. Extravehicular activity. <laughs> Okay, that's so, what that stands for. Doing something outside the ship. Yeah, I did write something about that. Okay. We don't have to talk about it right now, but well, I did. What, about Midnight Sky? Or, yeah. Or, okay. Um, let's just, we should just talk about Midnight Sky because it's like, okay. 
again, I don't know when this is going to go live, but as of the current recording, it's somewhat new. Yeah. I mean, in the internet age, if it's like a week old, I don't think it's new anymore, but somewhat new. I think it, it came it out. It came de- out in 2020. Yeah. So. December of 2020. Uh, so we're, we chose to watch separately and then come together and discuss The Midnight Sky. It's a Netflix movie. It stars and is directed by George Clooney. Um, it's based on a book. Yeah. The book is called Good Night. No, no Good, Good Morning, Morning Midnight. Midnight. Yes. Okay. Um, by Lily Brooks Dalton. Yes. I don't even know what, like, why it's called The Midnight Sky or what that title has anything to do with anything. Yeah. I don't either. Um, what did you think of that movie? I I liked it. I thought it was good. And I haven't seen a ton of Netflix like original movies, but I thought it was <laughs> I thought it was one of the better ones what's happening. I don't know, they're pawning <laughs> each other. Um I thought it was one of the better ones. Like I did enjoy it. Um, well, saying for my, what, did you my know? personal opinion, Uh-oh. saying it's one of the better ones for Netflix movies, that doesn't necessarily it's, mean it's good. The bar is pretty low. Remember when we watched Bird Box? <laughs> yeah, that movie's terrible. That movie's so bad, dude. And it was all anyone could talk about for a solid like month. But that's the thing about. I mean, I think we talked about this when we watched that movie. Like Netflix. It's so accessible. I mean, I would say this movie is definitely worth... The Midnight Sky is worth sitting on your couch and, like, pressing a button for sure. I agree. Like, it's it's interesting. It was... there, And there's... This, we're going to give a spoiler alert. <laughs> yeah. There's, this, there's a, like, a thing... Like, a twist in it. Um. So I liked it. I thought it had a good cast. It has George Clooney, um, Felicity Jones. David Oyelowo. Yeah, Oyelowo or something. Kyle Chandler. Yep. I um, I do enjoy a Kyle Chandler performance. I'm going to be able to hear that. <laughs> um, well, okay. So I feel like... So Heather, Heather's my other sister. If you're listening to this and you heard the first two episodes, they were with my oldest sister. Uh, uh, and so Heather is my other sister. And Heather and I, I think, often disagree about, like, science fiction. Like, I love science fiction. I think Heather likes it, but... I have a hard time with... I'm very like logical, like things need to make sense to me. So I do get a little caught up. I think sometimes in science fiction with like wrapping my head around it a little bit. And, but w- that being said, like I do think like a good story, good performances, if we're talking about movies, you know, if it's a book or like good writing, I, I think that I can get past it and I'm just like, okay, I don't need to totally get this. Um, but if not, then I, I just can't, like, it's just hard for me to really enjoy it. Yeah. Um, so, well, the, I, I say that too, because we're going to talk about another movie also starring George Clooney that is also very slow and science fiction. And I'm pretty sure Heather and I have opposite feelings about both movies. Like, I'm not going to sit here and say that Solaris is some like incredible movie that you have to like go out of your way to see but I think it is and we can get into why I think this I think it is far superior to the midnight sky yeah I don't know I just didn't enjoy that movie so let's just (laughs) let's start with the midnight sky yeah we'll get to I thought the midnight sky was so boring and like nothing about it felt like it had a point like i was intrigued in the beginning honestly the best part of the whole movie was when he first discovers the little girl yeah and he's trying to contact the people who left her there yeah and he's like i have a girl he's like what's your name <laughs> <laughs> and she doesn't answer. He's like, I have an unidentified girl. <laughs> that was funny. <laughs> like that part was hilarious. Um, <laughs> I, 
I don't even like, I, like the very, like, I feel like not enough was explained in the movie. Like, mm-hmm. I feel like when the movie starts, you, you, you're like wondering all these, you want to know a bunch of things. You're like, you're like, why is earth being evacuated? What happened to it? Like, what's up with these people on this ether spaceship? Yeah. Um, and I feel like nothing that's intriguing gets answered, but things that I didn't really care about were like given more light. Like it, it th- so the movie's two hours long and it has a lot of different things going on. Yeah. And yet it, I felt like nothing really happened. Yeah. I mean, I guess that's kind of true. Yeah. Not a whole lot did happen. Like let's start. Okay. So like there's flash. First of all, Maybe it's just like a new era of making movies, dude. But I'm so sick of like this de aging thing. And in this movie, they clearly use George Clooney's voice. Oh, I and, didn't notice and that. And put it in the mouth of the younger version of him, which is an actor, a different actor. Whereas if it was the Irishman, it would be him, but you know, de aged. Yeah. But like, you could clearly tell that that was George Clooney's voice, like modulated somewhat, oh, coming I out didn't of his mouth. Oh, I noticed that. I did. I'm 99% sure that that's true. Just because, like, the the actor doesn't even look like him. Yeah, that's what I thought was weird, because I was like, okay, I'm pretty sure this is George Clooney, but, like, they also did a bad job of making, of picking an actor who looked like him. But then I was like, were they trying to trick us? Well, that's the thing. Yeah, like, the movie almost, like, tries to kind of trick you, but about things that you don't care about. Well, I I mean, I I felt like I was a little bit tricked. So... Like, I don't know where, where, so like the stuff in the, the other thing, okay. Another thing I'm just want to ask you, remember in the flashbacks when he's like at that station thing and the girl and yeah. like his wife or whoever that was is like leaving. Yeah. And you saw that it was like, looked like summertime. Yeah. Is that supposed to be where he is through the maybe. action? I mean, of the maybe film? that's the problem with the world is that it's, it's covered in ice, ice and snow. And that's why people can't live there or, like, have anything. And then they Uh, go looking for a new planet. I guess. But, so that was confusing. And, like, I I didn't, like, I don't know how much I care about that relationship. I don't think I do. But I don't think that that relationship is very important. Okay. Um, I I think the movie does want to... Or And, you know, I haven't read the book. I don't know. I think it does want to, like, kind of trick you um, and make you not know what's going on. Because if you think about it, there's really, there's kind of two, like, um, realizations Okay. in the movie. Oh, yeah, yeah. That, that the, the first being that the little girl isn't real isn't real what and the second being that that girl's his daughter is, is his daughter that is so and ridiculous. then technically like that is what it's so ridiculous i don't think that's ridiculous did, did he know that she's his daughter i think he did so he's just so it's it's is the whole movie like i'm i feel like the whole movie is a metaphor for like like making connections and not getting lost in your work I, yeah, I do think that that's probably what part of it is about. So is he just like, it was just like this metaphor for like reaching across millions upon millions of miles to be like, like emotionally in touch with your daughter? Maybe. And like family? kind of like, you know, passing along because she's obviously kind of continuing with his work because she's like, oh, you're who inspired me. To get oh, into this. Yes. Okay. And then there maybe there's something going on with the fact that like she's also having a baby. Like maybe it's just showing that like even though the world is is people can't live there anymore, like life will go on. Like people will figure it out. Yeah. You know? Well, and there were people on Earth, but they were living underground. Because remember the two um two of the guys The brainless ones. <laughs> who want to go to destroyed earth yeah and, we're going and, and, back and waste a, a billion dollar but I don't know, vehicle I mean, that, to do that it that to me didn't really make sense because i was like how was so are they stupid. going to go there like because remember they said to him they were like are you sure there's no 
way that we can um, land right. this? And he was like, no. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess I don't know how their little well, spaceship I think, works. I, but I think the point... Is, so, basically... Um, well, maybe let's try to go, like, in chronological order. So, yeah. like, the action of the film is basically that, like, Earth is evacuated. George Clooney's, like, an astronomer who volunteers to stay on Earth and try to, like, and basically man this um, communications thing up in one of the poles. Yeah. And um, the the point of that you learn is so that he can contact this spaceship called the Ether, which only is on a mission because of his research that he found some moon orbiting Jupiter that's livable, which is, again, just weird that you would choose a thing that we've studied and, you know, and decide that there would be a moon with, like, vegetation around Jupiter. I mean, you can do whatever you want. It's science That's fiction. the <laughs> shit you put in another galaxy. But anyway, the, actually, no, that was the best scene in the entire movie because it tricked me in the beginning. I thought that it was going to be this like CGI heavy, like th- like they would be on this planet, but really yeah. she's just like dreaming. But that right. whole that whole sequence was amazing, dude. Just like the way that planet looked. Yeah, it was, was cool. Beautiful. Yeah, it was cool. Um, so he he volunteers to stay home simply to try to contact the ether and tell them, no, you should not come back to Earth. You should just go straight to this planet that you were really all you were doing was reconnaissance to tell mm-hmm. us if it was livable you decided it was livable you were coming back i guess to let us know i don't know and so his whole point and i remember that in the trailers i was like so the whole point of this movie is he's trying he's on earth and he's trying to contact the spaceship to tell them not to come back to go the other way yeah it's just a weird he's also sick though so i mean i think like he probably doesn't have like a lot of time left so he's like not concerned about himself anymore. True. He's more just concerned about like five people on a spaceship. Well, but I think that like, yeah, I mean, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> so is. yeah, that's okay. Okay. Another thing I'll say, just to keep this moving. Like the whole journey from the one station to the other. Yeah. Don't need it. You could completely cut that out and it would be the yeah. same movie. You could have had it all happen in one station. Yeah. But like, there was there was some um you know, there like things happened, like there's some tension like when they go when they find that plane or something that yeah. crashed. I mean, I, I like I want to get into this, man. Like what is the like that scene? Like I don't think it, it doesn't reveal anything. It doesn't like all it shows you is that he's protective of the girl because he doesn't want yeah. her to see the the like sick guy. Yeah. But like, and he we, doesn't want we, her to see that dead body, which she looks at anyway. Yeah. But like, we already know that the planet is dying. You know yeah. what I mean? So it's and we already know like the air is bad. So like, and then when they're in that shelter and it sinks. Yeah. I, I mean, maybe it is just because you need some like moments of yeah. tension. I mean, I was a little bit like, um. You know, I thought those. I thought that was like exciting. I didn't really get the one with the with the guy. When I mean, maybe it was just showing his character. Like he just would do what he had to do. You know, because what guy? The guy that was in the plane that was like alive. Also, that part really scared me. Uh, it made me jump. Oh, uh, when the hand like reached out and grabbed oh, actually, him. That was that wasn't bad. Yeah, I'll give you that. So maybe it's like because didn't he end up having to? like kill that guy like to put him out of his misery or whatever so maybe it was kind of showing like this guy is just like does what he needs to do and then the part when it sank i don't know i mean that yeah i don't know that was kind of crazy but i feel like all that scene and then all that scene did was like get rid of their means of transportation yeah and i was just like i feel like he would have died yeah. Like that did seem like a little yeah, bit too yeah, much. You, yeah, dude. He falls in the freaking water. Yeah, I know. Ridiculous. I was like, I don't think there's any way that yeah. he would survive that. And, and he was already sick. Yeah. So And then he's and then he's got his badass three uh, D printed rifle. <laughs> did you notice that? I did. Well, I noticed it looked weird, but it's science fiction, so I was like it could just be the futuristic. <laughs> I thought that thing was sick and then the right, future of guns. And then there's like 
a whiteout snowstorm and like the I guess wolves come. Yeah. And then the scene ends and you don't see any wolves, and you don't see anything and then he's in his in his little station. Yeah, but that so okay, so for me that was when I realized that the girl wasn't real. It was that scene. Okay. Because it just it it didn't like it d- didn't make sense like because he totally loses her. Yeah, I do. And that. I was just like, oh, gosh, like this is not good. Um, And you could see the wolves walking around, which was a little bit weird. Um, And then when he did finally see her, I was like, oh, that girl's not real. And that's when I knew like she wasn't real. I feel like I feel like if that girl acted like a normal human being, then I would have been. Either I would have been tricked or it's not that I knew she was not real, but I knew there's something going on. Like well, she acts so weird. I know. But I think one. So I think that that scene in the very beginning of the movie when that woman can't find her kid and then the other woman is like she got on another helicopter. Yes, she yes, got another yes. helicopter. I thought like that was a really cool thing to do because it tricks you. Then I was like. Oh, I mean, I had never seen a preview for the movie, but I'd seen it like when I go onto Netflix and it shows you a part of it. And so I was like, oh, okay, that's going to be the little girl that gets left behind. Yeah. And then it wasn't until, so that did trick me. Like that was really well done in my opinion. And then it was when, yeah, when the wolves came that I just, I was like, there's no way like he would have lost her and then found her. And it also kind of seemed like she was like keeping him going. So it was like, he was just like, oh, it's too crazy. I can't see anything. And then he saw her and he was like, oh, no, like, let's keep going. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's a I little mean, cheesy, but. <laughs> I, I, yeah. I mean, I was just. I thought the movie was like, maybe it's because I just watched so much sci fi. Like, yeah, that, maybe. So, and like, I took notes. Um, while I was watching it, the only positive thing that I wrote down mm-hmm. was I love the part when they're flying in the spaceship mm-hmm. and they're getting bombarded by like meteors. Yeah. And the side of the ship yeah, is that like was super cool. Like ripples. Yeah. I thought that was really cool. It was too. so cool. And you know why? Why? Because it's original. I've never seen it in yeah. any other exactly. science fiction movie or yeah. any other space movie, dude. Like it's so cool. Like to imagine. Like, and then you can, and I love like, the inside of that ship, how the walls looked like the gun. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Suggesting like that it's some kind of like, because like your bones are, are porous, you know? Yeah. And it they're did, super strong. Yeah. It did kind of remind you of like a skeleton or something. Yeah. yeah. Um, And it was cool too, after the all the damage, how they basic, how he says it and then you see it, he's yeah. like, oh, the 3D printer can take care of that. Yeah, like yeah, they have three yeah. D printers like on every part of the ship to just like right to just like build a new thing that gets destroyed, which is pretty cool. I thought that was actually really cool. Yeah, but then they do their little EVA. Yeah, and this sweet Caroline. And oh yeah, that like, was really stupid. I was just, like embarrassed watching that. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't love that. But you know, do I don't know how many movies have EVAs in them. I didn't know that's what they were called. Um, they just. I knew something bad was going to happen. Like I don't, I just don't trust them. And then, I I mean, I thought that scene was done well, like when she gets hurt and then she comes back in and like all that blood starts coming out of her. I mean, dude, that's okay. That scene would have been cool. Like if I gave an F about that character. (laughs) Okay. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like there's too many characters in that movie. Yeah. There are a lot of characters. Yeah. Like, all you learn about that girl is that she likes to sit on her stoop with her friends. Yeah. And she can't do that because she's in space. Right. Um, I again, know. I mean, I that's the thing. That I, mean, I, I feel like that's the thing with, like, net, at least the Netflix movies I've seen is that they're certainly, like, competent. Mm-hmm. And they're, like, not, they're not poorly made. But I don't know. It's, like, there just wasn't enough there for me to, like. Yeah care about like anything that was happening in the movie Um, yeah wait how did it end how did it end oh yeah okay no i wanted to talk about how they take that freaking ship down to earth yeah i hated that those two those two guys right Yeah, because it's like okay so earth is destroyed no one can go there 
you discovered a planet where humans can live. You're on a ship that's designed to go to that planet. Like, I would assume resources are limited for all of humanity since mm-hmm. we no longer have our planet. And you, just for like a for like a story beat in the movie, you're going to waste, you're going to take one of probably very few means of transportation and you're going to bring it down to Earth where everyone told you and everyone around you knows that you're not going to live. Yeah. And you're not going to bring that thing back up into space. Right. So you just, you're wasting it, dude. It's a waste. Well, I mean, I think he wanted to see his family. I'm not saying he's going to be successful in doing that. It sounds like, and that's, again, they show, like, they show graphs or, like, maps of the earth and, like, the whole earth is red, you know? Like, yeah. Like, not, yeah. not going to live. I don't know. Well, yeah, and I guess if they're living underground, like, that's really all we know about that. I mean, I feel like it comes down to, like, sometimes and sometimes in a movie, like, if you think a character is stupid or they're making a dumb decision, you're just like, dude, you're stupid. Like, this is a dumb decision. Yeah. You know? When did this movie take place? I have no did idea. This, did it tell us? The future. Well, no, no I, I don't. Get oh, uh, 2049, actually. Is that what it was? I just okay. remember that, yes. Okay. 2049. That's, like, not that far in the future. I know. <laughs> it's like a not movie, that far away. I actually watched a movie for, I was going to talk about an episode too, but we didn't get to it, called uh, Escape from New York. Have you heard oh, of it? Okay. I've heard of it. I don't think I've seen it though. It's a John Carpenter movie. It came out in 1981 and it takes place in 1997. Oh my gosh. As, as like the future. Yeah. That's so crazy. Yeah. I do think like things are so, I think you and Amy talked about this in another episode, but it's like when things take place in space in the future, you just can like make things look however you want. But it's like, I feel like a lot of stuff is probably going to look a lot like what it looks like now. Like it's probably not going to change that much. It's only 30, it's less than 30 years. Yeah. So it's kind of funny. Like you can guess all you want, but we probably make things look more like futuristic. Yeah, definitely. Than they actually would. Definitely. Um, so anyway, <clears throat> The Midnight Sky, if you're like starving for some sci-fi and you already have Netflix, check it out. I yeah. mean, George Clooney d- gives a pretty good performance. I mean, he's pretty like gross and old and like just... He did seem... Yeah, it was sort of a George Clooney... It was a George Clooney I hadn't seen before. Yes. <laughs> Bald with a big old beard. With a big beard. Yeah. But I mean, I liked his character. Like I thought it, he seemed like a, a fine person. I mean, I think he felt like he'd probably made some mistakes in his life and yeah. felt bad about that. Classic, like so. sad, overworked dad. Type yeah, cliche probably in regretting that he spent too much time working. Yeah, and didn't stay with his family. Stop. We got to stop just for a moment. Take a pause. The ISPCA has an announcement there is a crisis on mars and um we have a message please listen thank you martian refugees are not human the rapid expansion of mars colonies has pushed indigenous martian creatures out of their natural habitat those squat little kangaroos from the red planet need our help we took over their world please be kind and courteous and let one take over your backyard Are you living on Mercury or Europa with atmospheres that don't support Martian life? You can always donate. Contact our local interplanetary SPCA to find out more about adopting a Martian today. So let's move right on to... uh, Okay, let me ask you this. I know Heather didn't like Solaris. Okay, it's funny about Solaris. I say Solaris. I don't know how you say it. I I, I would assume it's a Polish word because it's based on a novel by a Polish guy. Oh, yeah. Okay. I don't really know. Um, Solaris came out in 2002. It was, I know all this shit from memory. It was produced by James Cameron and Steven Spielberg. Oh, my gosh. And directed by Steven Soderbergh. Dream Team. That's right. Starring George Clooney and Viola Davis. She is in it, yeah. Yeah. And the guy from the only other movie I recognize him from is Saving Private Ryan. The oh, skinny the guy, yeah. And he's then, a good actor. 
and then oh and his wife yeah his wife yeah yeah she okay it's funny that movie is such a like little time capsule because there was a time like that woman's not a very good actress and there was a time when she was in a lot of movies and like she's just not anymore yeah i shouldn't say that i feel bad saying that but she's like (laughs) and she's actually not that bad in solaris but in other movies it's like She's very striking looking. Well, I she was looks say, good on camera. She's kind of like otherworldly looking. Yeah. Like she was very good for a space movie. Yes. Like that's something that I thought about her. She's very like exotic and like yeah. like you said, striking. Yeah. Um she didn't have all that much to do in this movie, to be honest with you. Yeah. But <laughs> she's like She's like, I don't even know what she is. That's the thing about that movie, dude. Who even knows what the hell's going on there? Dude? Yeah. Okay, but let me ask you this. Okay, so you problem. let me ask you this. You like the Midnight Sky better than Solaris? From in in terms of just like a an enjoyable experience. Yes, I would say that I did. Okay, but while you were watching Solaris, did you or did you not put yourself in his position and really think about how like effed up it would be no i didn't think about that at all that really? movie doesn't make any sense it really doesn't make any sense to me so it's funny because I, okay you were saying like like to me solar just like left me wanting more like i just didn't feel like i had a good enough sense of like what that movie was even about and i also feel like there's probably some underlying Is it religion? Is it God? Like, I don't... I feel like there's something that that movie is about. And I just couldn't figure it out. So, like, on the surface, what is it about? Like, what's happening? I I mean, I don't know. Like, literally? Like, what's literally happening in that movie? Yes. So his wife is dead, and then he goes... To so that was part of the problem. Like when I was watching the movie, I was like, "What is Solaris?" Like I was like, "I don't get this," but it's a planet, right? Yes. And then they're on a space station Orbiting near the, the planet. planet. Yes. So the people on the space station, it's like nobody tells him what's going on before he gets up there. They're just like, "We need you to go up there," and then he's like, "Okay," and then it's because they don't want anyone to come and and there are there's. There's two, there's three people on that ship, though, on that, whatever it is, space station. Yeah. So I, what, like, I don't even get that. So, and, and of the, well, I mean, you find out, like, what's going on with the guy, but, like, the woman, the Viola Davis character, like, she's not about this. Like, she doesn't want what's happening to be happening. What's happening? That their dead loved ones are just appearing to them. Isn't that fucked up? It's. Yes, but it doesn't. If you knew there was a place you could go and that would happen, wouldn't you go? Well, but I think the thing is, no, I don't. Or would you think be afraid of it like Viola Davis is? No, I don't think that I would. So here's the thing: I think for him, for the George Clooney character, it was he felt bad because you find out that his wife killed herself. Yeah, and he left her and then he came back so he left her and she's in the house and then he came back to get her and she was and she had killed herself so i think he feels very guilty he feels very responsible yeah but then the first time that the wife appears he like puts her in a little spaceship and sends her away yeah and then she comes back again so like then i think he just feels bad well i think he doesn't understand it at first i think that's the point of the first one is that he's just getting all these hints from people like yeah like the guy who tells him to come to Solaris doesn't tell him what's going on but that dude actually I've seen that movie quite a few times yeah watching it this time was the first time I ever realized that that guy says to him like that guy is luring him there because he wants him to have this experience I didn't realize that oh. like the first Is he the one that introduces them like yes. they meet at his party? Yes. Yeah. So that's why he's luring or whatever that thing was. That's why he's luring um George Clooney's character there because he's like, dude, I know like your wife is dead and I know you feel terrible about it, so come here and this yeah. crazy anomaly is happening. So I noticed that. But like no one tells him anything. Like cuz I think that's what's so interesting about the movie for me is it, 
like like what like all the implications and and you're right like they don't tell you what they don't tell you much yeah but what all the characters like suggest or like surmise are super interesting like i i like at first like i take on like george clooney's attitude where it's like you know i'm here i'm I'm experiencing this thing but then at the same time i totally sympathize with um viola davis because like to her it's interesting because like to him like the woman is his wife Mm -hmm. but to viola davis it's an alien you know it's like not human that's the thing she says in the movie she's like it's not human and it's like yeah. it's it would be so easy to forget that if you were dealing with I feel like I would just be like super freaked out. I don't know. I can't I I don't even feel like I can really put myself in that position because it's really out there. True. So maybe I wasn't I maybe I just wasn't able to identify with them. I also don't think it, I didn't think that George Clooney and the the um woman who played the wife had any chemistry like I didn't it's that lady man I just didn't get like I think that's why it just seems like he feels guilty because he doesn't even act like they like love each other that much I don't know so I didn't like love their relationship and then there were things there were parts in that movie that I just like literally didn't understand like there was some weird part where he like woke up towards the end and it looked like somebody had like torn the wall apart or something. Like I, oh, yeah, yeah. I don't remember. There that were party. moments where I was just like, "What is going on?" I did think it was cool, and again, like this is kind of like, um, you know, this is like storytelling and like the tools you have to tell a story. I thought it was very cool that the guy ended up being like he says. He said, "Who is your visitor?" And he said, "My brother," and then. No one assumes it's your twin brother, so nobody would know that it was actually the the visitor that was there, and he had killed the real one. So that's confirmed? I think that's what they were getting at. Okay. I think he... I love that. I, I, I knew that that was so brought So I thought up, that part was really cool. But well, I wasn't I, sure if it was confirmed. That's how I took it. But Which is funny, because I, like I feel like nothing way. in this movie made sense to me, and then I was like... That's cool. And I totally took it for what it was. But I think, again, I think it's all about storytelling. Like, and the assumptions that people make or don't make because you don't present it to them. Like, if he had said my twin brother, then people would have gone like, oh, wait a minute. So that guy would look just like him. But instead, you're like, oh, his twin brother. But he didn't. And that guy acts so weird. That guy is so weird. But it's completely, it's totally normal for him to be so weird. Because A, we don't know him. Mm-hmm. B, he's in a super weird situation. Yeah. So anybody would act weird. And even if you're not near Solaris and weird supernatural things are happening, like if you volunteer to go on a mission like that, you're probably kind of weird. Yeah. So that's just... So, and, and you Dude, know, the reason I, honestly, as much as I will agree with you that that is a boring ass movie, <laughs> I think it's amazing, dude, because it's, it creates this kind of conversation and like, yes. and, and like you are pointing out things to me in that movie that I, like when you say it, it makes perfect sense, but I never picked up on it. And I've seen that movie plenty of times. Yeah. Um, but remember, that's what I said. Remember when I was like, Solaris is going to be a good discussion because yeah. Like, I didn't like it. You do like it. And then the fact that, like, you know, I mean, I took notes when I was watching it. And I wrote down this quote. I don't remember who said it. But at one point, somebody said, like, in regards to Solaris, there's no answers, only choices. Like, that's kind of cool. Yeah. Like, when you're up there, there's no answers. Like, no, you know, you don't know what's going on. Yeah. But it's all about choices. I think, too, the movie starts out way stronger than it ends i think it kind of overstays its welcome because i think the mystery in the beginning is so interesting at least for me yeah um i just because if you think about it it's a little more realistic i feel and i love people like with science fiction if you inject any amount of realism like i love that yeah is like 
what could you possibly say to him? Could you could you tell him the truth? Could you tell anyone back on earth the truth about what is going on? No, because they won't believe you. Right. And B, like if you think that what's happening to you is either contagious or you could bring these beings back to earth with you. And what the woman mentions, she's like, if this happens on earth on a mass scale, like that is game over, dude, for everybody. Yeah. Like you couldn't, like you wouldn't want some like team of like, I don't know, people to come there. You'd maybe want one dude, especially one dude that you know. And that's actually, I find that very interesting. I completely forgot about how in the beginning they say that a team of like Marines or like uh, security guys did come to oh, Solaris. Oh yeah, that's right. And like, just to imagine like why that didn't work out. Like what, what did, how, what well, happened is, to them? Yeah. I mean, it's very mysterious. I, I agree with you that it starts off strong. Yeah. And I feel like it's very like moody in the beginning. Like, and you get these little snapshots of like them together. Right. And, um, and then I do like it when he first gets to the ship because it's like creepy and weird yeah. and it's super deserted. Like, I'm sure that that probably is what it's like on like space stations or whatever. But I was just like, there's nobody like what? Where is everybody? Like, it just seemed yeah. creepy. And then like when he finds like blood. Yeah. And you're just like, wait, what is happening? But then. So is it only people that are dead who show up because is that kid okay i thought it was in my memory of that movie that's what i thought but again watching it recently for this podcast yeah someone because he says someone says about a visitor that they're back on earth so it must not be dead people no it must yeah because that's what i thought that and I also think that that's how the the movie is described. Like if you re, if you like when I looked it up online, it says the it says that the people are dead. But I don't. Yeah. It's some. But then something made me think that they weren't all dead. It's so much more interesting if it's only dead people. Yeah, because I think I like what I read. It said something like if they're if someone that's dead, or if you miss them. Oh. Uh. But, Maybe, but like, I mean, that would make sense because I'm pretty sure a it's a bunch the, of people. It's the guy's kid. Yeah, it is who the guy's he kid. Says is back on Earth. So I, the other, my other issue with this movie is just that I didn't understand in the end, and I feel like I was supposed to understand, and then I just didn't because remember in the beginning when she first appears, the wife, and she says like, "You never had any pictures, not even on the fridge." I'm pretty sure is what she says. Okay. And then remember at the end when he's like back on earth and he like closes the refrigerator and there's a picture of her on it. Okay. I, I, I honestly don't understand the ending. I thought I did, but watch well, once again, watching it again, I don't so like fully understand. I was looking at, I was, I was kind of reading about it online. And like one of the things it said is like, she talks about how like, I'm only, she's like, I'm only, your memory of me. Right. Like, I'm not me. I'm suicidal because you remember me as suicidal. Right. But then this thing that I read online said that, like, she remembered it wrong, like, about the not there not being any pictures. And so it's actually not, she's actually not just his memory of her. Like, there's something more real about her. Well, when he gets back, his cut, he has the cut. Yeah, I didn't get and that part it, either. And then it, if it heals, that means he's a copy. So, that, yeah, that was the other thing that I read, that it wasn't that like it that was not him. Maybe, maybe her copy. Oh, boy. <laughs> dreamed up him as a copy. Maybe. And he died, but his copy made it back to Earth. I don't have a clue. Man. Yeah, because I also didn't get the end when like it was what was happening. It was moving closer. Oh, it was growing. It was growing. Oh, is that what it was? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the little boy was there. So then, yeah, so then, okay, that's another thing that I read too. Remember, she was pregnant and she got an abortion. And that was like what started them having a fight. So then something that I read online was like, maybe that kid isn't. But that wouldn't make sense because how would that kid already be there? You know what I mean? The kid was already on. No, that, they the say ship. Ex- expressly that the kid is his friend's kid. Yeah. Um, 
Okay, I'm not going to lie. When I was a kid, okay, so <laughs> when I was younger, I think one of the reasons I have such a high regard for this movie is because, like I said, it came out in 2002. I was 12 mm-hmm. years old. And for whatever reason, we had a copy at the house, like on DVD. I don't remember why. <laughs> oh, that's weird. <laughs> so I would watch it. And like, I was really into space and like CGI and stuff like that at that age. So I think I, I think of it as such a, it's very striking to me because at that age, I wasn't watching these slow, mm-hmm. thought-provoking, psychological science fiction movies, you know? So that was the only one I ever had. So for me as a kid, to be like, like the CGI is really good, like yeah. the acting is good, it's it's interesting, so like I should like this. Yeah. And But I think my point is I had nothing to compare it to. I had right. no other like... I'd never seen 2001. I'd never seen like all these like space movies that are like more like uh, heady. Not like a blockbuster. Exactly. Yeah. Not like an action movie. Right. So to me it was like, oh man, like this is so cool. Like, but. Yeah. I mean, it is cool. You just take a drama and you set it in space. You know what I mean? Supernatural drama. But it's also, I mean, this, this movie is also a remake. True, but it's also based on a book, which I've read. Exactly. Oh, okay. So the book, I read the book a long time ago. The only thing I really remember about it is that Solaris isn't a planet in the book. Oh. It's an ocean on a planet. Okay. And the people are not in a spaceship in the book. They're Mm -hmm. on a little space, or they're on like a little settlement, like a little, like something George Clooney is in in the Midnight Sky, like like a self-contained little like outpost. And the ocean is what is alive and and messing with them. And I think the idea is that the planet itself, whatever Solaris is, whether it's an ocean in the book or a planet in the movie, it it is like, it is one intelligence and it's studying humans. Yeah. Um, Yeah, I mean, I did like, yeah, it's just weird though. I mean, it's like, why would it do that? Why would it make your loved ones come back to life. I don't know. Maybe it's just yeah, I don't know. weird, but it is. It, it's like, it's reading your mind or something. I almost feel like the movie could use a little more Viola Davis. Cause every time she yeah. like her and him would always butt heads, you know? Right. Like I liked all the things that she had to say to counteract what he always had to say, you know? Right. Well, she I, was maybe coming at it from a more scientific yeah, uh, and I view love, and I he love, was more like feeling exactly. Yeah. And I love what she says, and it's like vague enough, but it works. And like why she feels the way she feels when she says, she goes, I forget. She, at the end of it, she says, "All I know is that I want to stop it, mm-hmm. or that I want it to stop." Yeah, like she doesn't even like she just. I think her outlook is like. I just want to prove that I'm smarter than than whatever this is. Right. Remember? Did we already talk about who was her person? I don't even know. Yeah, and like, remember she like wouldn't let him in her room? Probably because her person's in there. And she then it was like it. when he fir- <laughs> when he when he fir- when he was like talking to her through the door, and you heard this like banging around. Oh, like, yeah. was she? Oh, I yeah. was wondering if she was like holding them holding her person like captive or something and like, you know, I don't know. There's a lot of mystery. There is a lot of mystery. Dude, imagine how sad would it be if you found at the end that it was like her dog or something. Oh God, what? (laughs) I wonder if that's possible. I, to be honest with you, I would not, I, if, if, if my dog showed up, I would have a much harder time like being like, you're not real. (laughs) Like, this is bad. I'd be like, you're a cute dog. Yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, animals already seem so innocent. But that's kind of what it is. Like, you go up there and this this thing is created because of you. And then is it really okay for you to destroy that thing? So, I mean, that's also part of the question. He does do, like, the the hastiest thing to the first one. Yeah, you know? and he like tricks her. He's like, "Oh, get in this little." I know. She like goes in a tunnel. Like, "Ooh, what's this?" And then yeah. it said, "Like, that, it was so weird." I don't yeah. know. And I also had no sense of like time in this movie. 
Like how? Because I felt like when the people that were already on the space sta- space station talked about it, they were like, "It'll start happening to you." Oh gosh, just wait. And then it happened to him like the first night he was there. Well, remember? Okay, this is another thing <laughs> so that I'm remembering. Like, it, it happens every time you go to sleep. So then that's like very quickly. Like they acted like it didn't happen right away for them. Maybe it, I don't know. Maybe so I'm then sure. I was just like, okay, well, th- we're just moving this right along. Yeah, I mean, it does bounce around. I feel like at, you kind of, I feel like at one point he's, she's like, you'll have to sleep eventually. He's like, I won't sleep. <laughs> it's like a couple scenes ago, like you're in bed with the girl and now you're not going to sleep yeah, just to prevent I, her from showing up. I do feel like that was like part of the whole thing was that they had a very like physical relationship and then it was like. You know, she was a very physical thing. Like, whatever she was, you know, she obviously was an actual, like, thing that he could, like, touch and, you know, like, right, interact right. with. So I, d- I did get the idea that their relationship, that we were supposed to, you know, see that they were, like, very attracted to each other. And, like, yeah. you know, maybe he got, like, a little caught up in that because did he really... Like we never saw them having like a real relationship, you know. Yeah, I think in the I think maybe I'm putting my finger on it now, and maybe like maybe we can move on after <clears throat> this. Is like in the beginning when you think that it's just sad, like that when in the beginning when you just feel bad for him. Yeah, it works better than by the second half of the movie when you find out what kind of like a f- fucked up like toxic relationship they had yeah then you're like oh dude like you're just gonna you're probably gonna treat her copies exactly like you treated her and she ended up killing herself right so that's when it becomes in the beginning when you're like oh like i I guess that's what i'm getting at it's like in the beginning you put yourself in his shoes and you're like that would be amazing like obviously it's like a miracle to be in that situation to be with your loved one no matter who it is family member significant other yeah it would be amazing but then you get and maybe it's just like a metaphor for humanity. It's just like, dude, humanity's messed up, man. And like, yeah. if you bring back someone who you loved, like all of them is going to come back, right? Not just, not just like your your good memory, right? So, yeah, I will. It's definitely if you've like never seen Solaris, and you can get it cheaply, <laughs> I would check it out. I mean, you can get it cheap. I mean, I rented it. I did line. Well, yeah, I rented it. Probably to four bucks. Yeah, I think it was pretty cheap. Um, but I mean, it is it it is thought provoking. Like it did make me think. Yeah, it did make me like write things down. It did make me look it up when I was finished watching it to be yep. like, okay, what's <laughs> yeah, what is this about? Yeah. Um, but like I said, in terms of like sitting down and like having just an enjoyable viewing experience, I'd say I got that a little bit more from The Midnight Sky. But again, I mean, this one's a little more interesting to talk about. So true. It has that. I mean, that's going for yeah, it. There are so many different like things. I don't know, like science fiction. It, it can go either way. You know, it can be like just mindless stare at the pretty yeah. colors or it can be soup. Or it could be like you're confused the whole time you're watching it and you're like, that was dumb. But then two days later, you're still thinking about it. Right. Those are my favorite kind of movies, dude. Like, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. And I feel like I get that the most out of science fiction. So in this, if I decide to name these episodes, mm-hmm. I think a good name for this one yeah, would be Blue Monkey. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to say George Clooney. <laughs> no. Blue Monkey. Blue Monkey. Blue Monkey. <laughs> um, so Heather and I, we were going to watch two comedies, but then she brought Heather brought up Solaris, and I was like, yes, we should talk about Solaris. <laughs> and in my mind, when Heather brought up Solaris, I was like, I know she's going to hate it, but I'm not going to say that it's bad. Yeah. Or I'm not going to well, say you're not going to like it. That movie's on a lot of lists that I looked up online. I was trying to figure out what we should watch of like, science fiction movies you should watch or like space movies you should watch like clearly people like it yeah um especially to like the the original is a classic and i read some people think that new one's better which is like i mean dude i'm an advocate for like weird sci-fi and like (laughs) slow boring george clooney movies but like 
I wouldn't put that on like a best sci-fi movie list, really. Yeah. I don't think. I don't. I. I don't know. But okay, so we were gonna watch two comedies, <clears throat> Slither <laughs> and Evolution. We didn't get to Slither, but I mean we, we've seen that, but yeah. I haven't seen it in a really long time. <laughs> I haven't seen it in a really long time. <laughs> but either. I'm still gonna. Wa- I'm. I gotta watch it. It's like yeah. on my mind now. Slither is amazing. Um, but we did recently. I watched Evolution like a week ago. She watched it recently. Yeah, and I've seen Evolution enough times. Yeah, we're big fans <laughs> of the movie Evolution. So I guess I just want to say, like, if you love sci-fi, there's plenty of, like, I feel like Evolution does such a good job of being, it, it it's, it's a straight-up comedy, but the sci-fi is really good and, like, really well done. Yeah. It really is, dude. It, it, it amazes me watching that movie, like, just how much of a bull, like, of a big budget movie, it feels like. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it doesn't feel cheap. Well, it's um, it's the guy that did Ghostbusters. Yes. Uh, uh, Ivan Reitman. Yes. So I mean, it's kind of like that, I think. I, I, okay, you're right. And when I, knowing that, <laughs> like sometimes you find out about some like random weird movie and you're like, why does that movie exist? Yeah. And, then you, and then you look it up and you're like, oh, because this person was involved. Right. You know what I mean? Right. And like when I do that with Evolution... Besides Dan Aykroyd, like, I don't think there's that much of a s- similarity between Evolution and Ghostbusters. No, I, I mean, I think it's just that it's kind of crazy. Yeah, it's like a funny supernatural, or yeah. in this case, science fiction. <laughs> yeah. But It's so funny. Okay, so watch that movie for the first time in a long time. Dude, the best part about that movie is Orlando Jones. Oh my God, I know. He is so, <laughs> so funny. The, also, one of the best parts about that movie, I don't know who wrote the script, but it has like amazing li- lines in it. The dialogue is yeah. amazing. What's your favorite? I Well, okay, so I have a few favorites, but one line that I really love from that movie yeah. is um, when they're at the restaurant and somebody asks <laughs> Sean William Scott, they're like, are you going to eat that? And he says, he gives the best answer to that question that I've ever heard. And it's, yeah, I'm going to eat it. I ordered it, didn't I? <laughs> like, it's, I just love it. Yeah. So that one I really love. I do love Blue Monkey. I love the bureaucratic... Gold, crapola. Crapola. What is it? Yeah. Yeah. Dan Aykroyd. <laughs> so the, mo- the movie part. takes place in Arizona. And Dan Aykroyd's <laughs> the governor of Arizona. Yeah. And he's like... He's just super, like, uh, hyper. Yeah. He, he, like, shows up because it's, like, the first time he's heard about aliens crawling over his beloved state. (laughs) And he's, like, they're showing him these graphs. And he's, like, I don't know how to read all this. Yeah. (laughs) He's, like, that's I've had enough of your bureaucratic crapola. But I love, I mean, that's actually, like, pretty realistic. I'm sure, like, scientists would show, you know, the the government. And they'd be, like, I don't know what this is. Like, this is doing me no good. Just tell me, like, what I need to do and when. So I think, yeah, what's your favorite line? My favorite <laughs> line? Dude, I don't know. It might be like, honestly, my favorite line might be, I wish I got to try to remember it. When I watched it, I was like, I need to remember this so oh. I can recite it. It's when he goes, it? It, it, it's when they go, when they see all those like dragon things coming out of the, like a, in the desert. Yeah. And he's like, and then Harry Block yep. explains why that's happening. Yep. And they're like, oh, I'm impressed. And he go he goes he's like beneath this calm, sexy exterior beats the heart of a true scientist. <laughs> it's just like, because what? he's wait, so he is what does he teach? Geology. Okay, and he's also like what, the girls volleyball? <laughs> yeah, he's like he's like, Am I growing as a professional? Yeah. Am I growing as a person? Am I growing as a division three women's volleyball coach? <laughs> so he's like a little bit slimy. Like he's Yeah. You know, and he's helping that girl with her like extra credit or something. Oh, yeah. Um, and then and then David Duchovny is like more serious. Like he's really a scientist. Yeah, like a disgraced one. Yes. I because forgot he, about the cane madness. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I'm also, I feel like that movie is the kind of movie that I would discuss. Like if I didn't see it when it came out. I would discover it now and be like, yo, there's this hidden gem. I know. Like, this movie came out in 2001 and it has amazing CGI. Right. It's totally hilarious. Right. And it has like dope science fiction in it. 
you know? Like, yeah. it's almost like, uh, I don't know, like, I, sometimes I just think, when I watch it, I kind of just think back to when, like, you and I watched it, I remember, mm-hmm. like, at the house, <laughs> like, we rented it, freaking Blockbuster, probably on VHS. Oh, I miss Blockbuster. And we watched it, dude, and, like, I just remember at the time, I, I was not obsessed with science fiction, I didn't yeah. necessarily love comedies, but, like, if, at that time, man, when I was in my early teens, if you showed me any creature yeah. made out of CGI, I was down, man. Like, sign me up. I love that shit. Yeah. I was, like, all about it. So when the trailers always featured, like, you know, like, the aliens. Yeah. I was like, dude, sign me up. And we watched yeah. it. It's totally hilarious. It's so funny. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't know what I was expecting going into it, but I feel like maybe I didn't expect it to be that funny. I feel like I liked this movie more than I thought I would. Dude, it's such a... Re- like, when I first It's so it. ridiculous, dude. Like, remember when, they, remember when they kill the dragon in the... In the mall. Yes. And then the next scene, they're just driving in the Jeep, yeah. singing Play That Funky Music, <laughs> White Boy. And it's like its own scene. Yeah. It's so hilarious. I love that part, too, in the mall when the girl's like trying to steal stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and then, you know, she's like, it's the creature is like knocking on the door. Yeah. And she's like, oh, my God, I'll be right out. And then it like takes her flying around the yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it like teaches her a lesson she's like i'll never steal again yes yeah, like, i just promise i will never shoplift again. yeah like i just i love that like that whole part is just so funny and I, we had I, I mean i can't talk about movies from this time period without mentioning and this movie is a classic example dude just the death of the pg-13 comedy oh this yeah it's i mean it's basically i attribute the film knocked up or 40 year old virgin like once yeah. um what's that guy's name judd apatow started making r-rated comedies yeah once that happened pg-13 comedies just ceased to exist we did uh, i think pitch perfect is a good example of a successful pg-13 comedy in the last 20 years yeah. but it, it it's just like an it's it's like a, it's it's like a dead genre right and and this is just one of those shining examples of how pg-13 like not every other word being about sex and the F word and yeah. this and that can be hilarious. Right. Dude, what about one of my favorite scenes is I love how like <laughs> slightly hostile um, Orlando Jones' character is towards white people. Yeah, yeah. And dude, my, my, <laughs> one of my favorite parts in the whole movie is his name is Harry Block. So when he meets um, D- David Duchovny's old boss, he goes, uh, Harry Block, blah, blah, blah. And then later... The guy goes, he goes, why don't you and Mr. Black? Oh, and Orlando Jones just goes, block. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, looks right at David Duchovny like, dude, I told you he's racist. <laughs> and I, the one thing that I think is like weird about that movie, it, I mean, it doesn't make me not like it or anything, is like Ju- the Julianne Moore character, like she's so like clumsy. Yeah. Remember that? It's like kind of a weird thing about her character. She's always like falling over and like dropping things. Yeah, it <laughs> appears to be like her number one uh, characterization is that she's yeah. clumsy. And it's like, I don't know. It's kind of weird. Yeah. It's a little sketchy too when the first time she falls <laughs> and they can see her like garter belt or something. <laughs> Which is like really old fashioned. And they're like commenting on it. <laughs> It's just like guys, like what? And I love the two, um, the the two guys that are in his class. Oh yeah. Um, I don't. One of them is um from Salute from that show. Yes, yeah, Salute Your Donkey Shorts. Donkey Lips. Yeah, Salute Your Shorts. Um, and they're like, you know, when they're like standing over the crater, yeah. and he almost falls in. Yeah, like, almost went down on that one. Yeah. And then and the other one's like, that was awesome. Yeah. It's like, dude, he almost died. So like, I just love like that whole part. Like it's just got a great cast too. Yeah. And like Sean William Scott, I mean, where is he these days? He was like a big deal for a while. Yeah. But he's so like, it, they're just really good comedic performances. Yeah, dude. All around. It is. Yeah. It's amazing, dude. It's a really good cast. Or like that, those three and even Julianne Moore would work so well off each other. Yeah. I like in the beginning when he's, when, uh, cause in the beginning, Sean William Scott works into this because he's a fireman. <laughs> and in, in, in the first scene of the movie, he's, he's practicing getting a, a woman out of a little shed, a burning shed. A burning shed. <laughs> so he's like, he has this dummy yeah. that, like, that makes like a squeaking noise and has like blonde hair. 
and he puts her in a in the sh- in the shed. Yeah. And he's like unscrewing a gasoline cap. And he's like, he's like ignored all the warnings. Yeah. Smoking in bed, fell asleep. <laughs> Big mistake. <laughs> and he lights the shed on fire. He's so funny. And then while he's saving her, the meteor comes down and crashes into his car. Yeah. But then the next day, you got Harry Block and Ira Glass, David Coveney and Orlando Jones. He's like, you're the one who found the meteor? He's like, yeah, I found it. It bounced my car 200 feet in the air. (laughs) (laughs) And he goes, he's like, so you and the blonde here found the meteor? (laughs) He's pointing to his little dummy. It's so the movie is just it's like everything. And then when they when in the media in the crater, when it like starts to create its own atmosphere, like atmosphere, yeah. like even that part is really cool when they go down there and it has yeah. all the vegetation and then it has all of the um, the there's like big bugs walking yeah, around. Yeah. He's like the tree just ate it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and they like put and they, oh, that part's so funny when they go down in the elevator and he's like oh. dancing. They have their little outfits on yeah. and he's I don't know what he calls himself, but Orlando Jones is just like doing like a disco yeah. dance in the he's, elevator. <laughs> I think he calls him oh, like DJ Harry Block or something yeah, like that. Something like that. And then David later, David comes. He's like, he's like, we got to get out of here. And he's like, he's like, I second that. This disco suit's making me chill. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> disco suit. And then the, when they go, because a bug gets in his suit. Yeah. And it it goes. I don't know. It's like un, oh, I think it goes in his butt. Yeah. So it's like it under his skin. And when he goes, remember when they go to the hospital and he's like, we're gonna have to take the leg off. And he's like, don't take my leg. And then it's going back up. <laughs> He's like, it's going for the crotch. Yeah, he's like, take the leg, take the leg. Take it, take the leg. <laughs> yeah. So it's just, he is so great in that movie. You're right. Yeah. He is like the best part about it. But 100%. the whole, everybody is so good yeah. in it. How does that movie end? Does the, it have something weird at the end? Well, the giant. Yeah, well, so let's just give a super quick of the plot because we haven't even talked about plot. Basically, a <laughs> uh, meteor hits Earth in Arizona and there's like a liquid inside the meteor yeah. and the characters take the liquid and they, they study it and they find out that within the liquid is single celled organisms. And then just a couple hours later, they look again and they're multicellular organisms. So the, the gimmick, I guess of the movie is that you like aliens crash on earth in a meteor, but they're single to celled organisms, but their evolution, why it's called evolution is like a billion times yeah, faster. Crazy. So they go from single-celled organisms all the way to at the end of the film, which is maybe a couple weeks or a week. Yeah, it's not very long. (laughs) They evolve from a single-celled organism to a primate. Yeah. And but at, at that's the blue monkey. Yeah. At the same time, there's like all these different variations, like all these creatures, like dragon looking ones, alligator looking ones, like bugs and stuff. And then in the end, they find out that fire is what made them evolve in the first place because yeah. the, the meteor goes enters our atmosphere and the heat from entering the atmosphere causes you know uh, a chemical reaction yeah so then the bad guy or the general's plan is to use napalm remember yep and so he's they realize they realize if you use napalm it's just going to make it worse make it awful so but they end up using the napalm and it turns into like a remember a giant blob yeah and it just get, it gets like massive like bigger than a skyscraper <laughs> And they kill it with uh, shampoo. Yeah, with head and shoulders. Yeah. Because the two brothers are so flake-free. Yeah. Haven't you noticed how shiny and (laughs) flake-free our hair is? I mean, that's probably (laughs) something that doesn't make any sense. Because remember, she has that periodic table shirt on. And he's like, if you move, like, two over and you go. And it's like, what? Yeah, no. But they, like, shoot it up out of the fire trap, the fire hose. (laughs) Yeah. And then they just kill it and everything's good. Yeah. Yeah, I guess. basically. Yeah. <laughs> and then um Yeah, I mean that's pretty much the ending. I love at the end though when the governor played by Dan Aykroyd is handing out like medals or whatever yeah. for the, f- the four people who did it. And um like Orlando Jones, he's like first of all, I want to thank God. Without yeah. him nothing is possible. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, just... and then uh and then um Julianne Moore and Ira go in the fire truck yeah. and Dan Aykroyd's like, where are they? And uh, 
Orlando Jones, he's like, I think he's giving her a bit of the cane madness. Cane madness, yeah. Because, <laughs> of course, they don't like each other in the beginning. Nope. But then they fall in love. Yep. It's the cane madness. <laughs> um, all right. Well, if you've never seen... It's like a hair. <laughs> if you've never seen Evolution, I strongly suggest you check it out. It's, it's really good. So funny. And actually, believe it or not, has like some pretty awesome like science fiction things going on and for coming out i think 2001 maybe 2002 it, no it's 2001 i wrote it down okay. yeah 2000 for 2001 dude special effects are on point mm-hmm. like the cgi is really good in that movie yeah i mean i don't yeah it totally is yeah it's re- really cool hi space dreamers thank you for coming this far into my podcast uh before we get into the actual novel the reason we're here we have to take a super quick ad break so be right back the Lightyear Walkie Talkie is here. Chit chat with your friends on the moon. Discuss politics with your co workers on Pluto. Break the sound barrier with your very own voice. The Lightyear Walkie Talkie's radio waves will penetrate even the densest dust clouds between the planets. Don't rely on expensive government relays with obnoxious response delays. Pay for your walkie-talkie with just one exchange of credits, and the delays are a mere one second per 500 million miles. Buy a light year walkie-talkie today. So now, an hour in, let's talk about the book. Okay. So we are here to talk about Islands in the Sky. By Arthur C. Clarke, and I'm going to give Heather did, did not read it. Um, episode one, Amy didn't read the book, so we just kind of talked about some interesting things. Episode two, Amy did read the book. Now, this is episode three, Heather has not read the book, but that's okay. <laughs> um, so I'm going to explain to you and also the listeners. Uh, I'm kind of trying to kind of describe this almost shared universe that Clark created. Mm -hmm. He did not intend to make like a, like a, like a unit, like a shared universe similar to like the MCU. Yeah. He didn't set out to do that, but, but all his, all his concepts and all his ideas and all his plots from his novels are based on like reality. Mm -hmm. What could potentially be real in the future. So if you base all your stories off of like one, like like uh, off of like real world science, they're all going to be pretty similar. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So in the first novel, so another thing I want to say is that it's cool that it's like a trilogy of this the first three novels are kind of like the first three novels are Clark basically finding his, his author legs, if you will. Um, <clears throat> the first novel, as you know, I think you've listened to episode one. Yeah. The characters, the, the whole book is just planning to go to the moon. Right. They don't even ever go. The The book ends with the ship taking off. Okay. So, but in that novel, they discuss the next step after the moon will be Mars. And okay. We're gonna, when we're going to colonize Mars. The second book is called The Sands of Mars. And it pretty much, you could say the world of the first novel is the same world pretty much of the second novel. Okay. Because in the second novel, it's about a science fiction writer who gets the opportunity to go to Mars and uh, like experience all this stuff that he only ever wrote about. Okay. So in that novel, <clears throat> um, the furthest man has ever been is to Jupiter. Okay. Or maybe Saturn. It's to Saturn. So Islands in the Sky is all about um it refers to all these different space stations or spaceships that in the future if humans take to the stars like Clark always wanted us to will be real so i mean i guess you could say that he predicted the international space station mm-hmm. cuz basically the islands in the title it refers to all these different like space stations yeah so our main character is a young 16-year-old boy. Oh. Okay. Interesting. And this young boy, I believe his name is Roy. Um, first chapter is called Jackpot to Space. Oh. Um, okay. <laughs> so how he gets the opportunity to go to space as a 16-year-old is he 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 joins this TV competition 
um, all about like aeronautics or something. Okay. And he wins. Oh. So this is what he says when he wins. <clears throat> so the 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 prize for winning is you can the TV show will purchase a ticket for you to go anywhere in the world. Okay. So this is what the kid says. Congratulations, Roy, said Elmer heartily, shaking my hand. Almost a perfect score. You missed only one question. I have great pleasure in announcing you as the winner of this World Airways contest. As you know, this prize is a trip. All expenses paid to any place in the world. We're all interested to hear your choice. What is it going to be? You can go anywhere you like between the North and South Poles. My lips went kind of dry. Though I'd made all my plans weeks ago, it was different now that the time had actually come. I felt awfully lonely in that huge studio with everyone around me so quiet and waiting for what I was going to say. My voice sounded a long way off when I answered. I want to go to the inner station. Omer looked puzzled, surprised, and annoyed all at once. There was a sort of rustle from the audience, and I heard someone give a little laugh. Perhaps that made Elmer decide to be funny too. Ha ha, very amusing, Roy. But the prize is anywhere on earth. You must stick to the rules, you know? I could tell he was laughing at me, and that made me mad. So I came back with, I've read the rules very carefully, and they don't say on earth. They say to any part of the earth. There's a big difference. Elmer was smart. He knew there was trouble brewing, for his grin faded out at once, and he looked anxiously at the TV cameras. Go on, he said. I cleared my throat. In 2054, I continued, the United States, like all the other members of the Atlantic Federation, signed the Tycho Convention, which decided how far into space any planet's legal rights extended. Under that convention, the inner station is part of Earth because it's inside the thousand kilometer limit. Elmer gave me a most peculiar look. Then he relaxed a little and said, Tell me, Roy, is your dad an attorney? I shook my head. No, he isn't. Of course, I might have added, but my Uncle Jim is. I decided not to. There was going to be enough trouble anyway. Elmer made a few attempts to make me change my mind, but there was nothing doing. Time was running out and the audience was on my side. Finally, he gave up and said with a laugh, Well, you're a very determined young man. You've won the prize. Anyway, it looks as if the legal eagles take over from here. I hope there's something left for you when they've finished wrangling. So you find out that this kid's uncle is a lawyer, and he figures out that through a loophole that on Earth... Uh, counts as 1,000 miles above the ground. Okay. And the lowest orbiting space station, the inner space station, is yep. within that range. So that's where he gets to go. Smart Pretty kid. sneaky. Right? <laughs> I think that's pretty cool. So another thing you need to understand, Heather, oh, okay. is that starting in episode two, and something I'm going to be doing in every single episode, yep. and why I named this podcast The Space Dreamers, is because in e- in each novel there are space dreamers and a space dreamer is basically someone who would give anything to see the wonders of space with their own eyes yeah okay so in the second novel there's one character who tells a story about going to saturn mm-hmm. and he talks about how it was this like horrific mission because multiple people died. Oh, God. And he says, but he did get the opportunity to stand on one of the moons of Saturn and see Saturn from the surface of the moon. Literally, it, the disk of the planet would take up half the sky. Isn't that trippy? Yeah. Do you want to go to space? Would yeah. you ever go to space? Well, no, I wouldn't go to space because I don't think... We don't live in like Arthur C. Clarke's like advanced right. world where space travel is like easy. Um, yeah, I don't think I'll ever get the opportunity. Like I lift my arm a little bit and it hurts. You know what I mean? Like you got to be like athletically. <laughs> you know what I, mean? I don't think I would want to go to space. I'd be, that just seems like a lot of work. 
Yeah. <laughs> You're, it probably would And it totally, right. space is like, just, I don't, it's so crazy that yeah. it's so big. So it's kind of weird to say this, but my co-host people is not a space streamer. <laughs> yeah, well... It's okay. No, but I we feel like to, you just said you wouldn't go either because your arm here, hurts. We are here to serve the space streamers. <laughs> doesn't necessarily mean we are space streamers. But let me give you an example of what this is a space streamer. Okay. Our young character, I feel like a fool because I don't know his name. Why don't you look it up? I don't. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Okay. Our young character, this is a whole paragraph unto its, unto its own. You ready? Okay. You see, I've been crazy to go out into space for as long as I can remember. I was 16 when all this happened, and rather big for my age. I'd read everything I could get a hold of about aviation and astronautics, seen all the movies and telecasts from space, and made up my mind that someday I was going to look back and watch the Earth shrinking behind me. I'd made models of famous spaceships and put rocket units in some of them until the neighbors raised a fuss. In my room I have hundreds of photographs not only of most of the ships you care to name, but all the important places on the planet as well. Mom and Pop had not minded this interest, but they thought it was something I'd grow out of. Look at Joe Donovan, they'd say. Joe's the chap who runs the copter repair depot in our district. He was going to be a Martian colonist when he was your age. Earth wasn't good enough for him. Well, he's never been as far as the moon, and I don't suppose he ever will. He's quite happy here, but I wasn't so sure. I've seen Joe looking up at the sky as the outgoing rockets draw their white vapor trails through the stratosphere, and sometimes I think he'd give everything he owns to go with them. Okay. So he is a total nerd, but also <laughs> he is a space dreamer. Um... So does that kind of like, do you kind of understand like what the concept of like a space dreamer? Yes. Cool. That's, yeah, that's like the point of the book. Like I just, or the point of the podcast rather. That's, I could, I decided like that's what I'm going to do with every book is determine who is a space dreamer. That's cool. Yeah. Um, I'm a space dreamer in my mind, I think. Like. Because when you ask me that question, I don't, I'm not very good with hypotheticals. Okay. Like, yeah, like realistically, no, I don't think it would be possible for me to go to space. Right. Given my age, what year it is. Like, but if you could, would you want to, I guess is like. Absolutely. Yeah. I would give anything. Yeah. I don't know. It sounds really scary. I don't think I'd go. Yeah. But like, what if millions of people had gone before you like airplanes? Yeah, I mean, I guess. I guess if it was like a more normal thing to do. Yeah. But like, could you imagine me in a spaceship? I would be like, I'd be freaked out. I'd be afraid to like touch anything. I just, I don't think it would be good. Well, there's a thing coming up in this uh, novel that I'm going to tell you about. Okay. That maybe you think it was even, it uh, was cooler. Oh, okay. So how do you feel about, there being no gravity in space, do you think you'd be able to deal with that? Well, have you ever skydived? No. You've been in like a little single engine airplane, right? Yeah. Was it scary? No. I mean, I feel like I wouldn't, I, I don't know that you would like feel like you were in space. I mean, <laughs> if I were in space, I would very much have to be just like a passenger. It's not like I would be able to like, you seem like you could pilot do a anything. <laughs> so I feel like it would probably be kind of like if you're on, like if you're on a big, huge boat, you don't necessarily feel like you're not like very aware of the fact that you're on a boat. You probably would just feel like you were just, you wouldn't really be that aware of it. Yeah, but there would be no gravity. So you'd be floating. Have you thought about what that would feel like? Do you float the whole time? Is there a way that you can not float? Yes. <laughs> okay. But generally that when would you're probably in space, be weird, you float. But it also could be kind of cool. That might be kind of cool. Okay. Well, now I want to just share with you and the listeners um, a little, uh, just one paragraph excerpt of Clark explaining, keep in mind, Heather, this book was written, this book was released in 1952. Oh my gosh. Okay. 
this is we're talking 16 years before man set foot on the moon that's crazy and clark's doing it with like relative accuracy but here this is for folks in the 50s folks listening now and you ready for this (laughs) yeah it's a strange thing but even now there are people who don't understand this business of weightlessness they seem to think it's something to do with being outside the pull of gravity that's nonsense of course in a space station or a coasting rocket 500 miles up gravity is nearly as powerful as it is down on the earth the reason why you feel weightless is not because you're outside gravity but because you were no longer resisting its pull you could feel weightless even down on earth inside a freely falling elevator as long as the fall lasted an orbiting space station or rocket is in kind of a permanent fall a fall that can last forever because it isn't toward the earth but around it Then that just sounds kind of scary. Certainly. So, yeah, if you constantly just felt like you were falling, I think that is in a free fall. How people describe it, really. But at the same time, like it looks kind of peaceful, though. If you're mm-hmm. just floating around, right? But at the same time, like roller coasters are fun. Roller coasters are fun. Is that feeling? But could you imagine like, if you felt like that all the time? If you felt like you feel on a roller coaster like for more than a few minutes. I don't know. I guess you don't know. Is that what people say, though, that it's it's like free falling? Yeah. But you know what I've heard about skydiving? What? Um, that you don't feel like you're falling because you don't have anything to, like, um, look at. Oh. You don't have any, like, point of reference. Yeah, if you were so next that, to, like, a wall. Right. Then you would you'd see it then, going by. Yeah, but I've, I, I've heard people say that. And so maybe that's what it is. Like maybe you just don't have any. It's not like something is flying by you. Dude, it's one of those things like if you think about it, it's so crazy to just be able to float. It's crazy to even be able to go to like space. Like I, I don't even it's like really weird when I think about it. Yeah. Like it's. Do you think we landed on the moon? No, yeah, I'm not saying that I don't think it's true. There's a lot of things that I don't understand. Like, I mean, it's crazy. Like, airplanes are crazy. You know what I mean? Like, just to think about, like, the mechanics of this is just... And I guess Arthur C. Clarke and any scientist, like, anybody who is like, "Ah, you know what we should do? Go to space. (laughs) Like, just that you would even think that that would be, like, possible is... Is crazy to me. Yeah. So you got to be dreaming, man. I know. Yeah. Be space dreaming. Yeah. <laughs> That's this is true. Okay, I want to bring up another character. So okay. basically, his name is Roy. Oh, you looked it up. I looked it up. <clears throat> okay, sweet. Roy Malcolm. Um, the m- the first note that I made, and people listening, and maybe you two are like, "What is the plot of this novel?" Like, like many Arthur C. Clarke novels, it really doesn't have a plot. Oh, okay. I thought it was this guy going to the space well yeah thing. i mean it yeah so, well i'm getting there so like oh, okay i said last episode i love arthur clark but at the same time like no one's perfect <laughs> and there are some flaws he he often depicts humanity in like a utopian society like with like no conflicts which is just like totally not reality yeah. I, don't, I don't think ever will ever be reality right um and it makes sense because like a lot of his novels are just like I have ideas and concepts that that I think will work in space, so I just need a way to show them to you. So I'm going to create like a novel, like a character to just go do those things, but they're not that much of a character, you know? Like the Roy in the book, he's just a kid. Like there's yeah. no defining characteristics about him. He's just a kid. Who it's likes like a means space. to an end. Yeah, I just exactly. need this to get this point across. So my first note here that I should have said first is that the novel is basically like it's an overblown tour and he has like tour guides who just show him around oh like he goes to like they go to like the interstation and then he goes something happened actually one part that's really cool is something (laughs) they end up going to 
like a, a hospital that's in orbit. Okay. And it's it looks like a flower. Like it looks oh. like a big white flower. I just loved like the imagery. That's cool. Maybe I can find it and read it in post, but no promises. Um, okay. <laughs> okay, but one really cool. Okay, so, okay, so I read this book way back in the day. I probably read this copy right here. Yeah. Like probably eight, seven years ago. What, the only thing I really remembered from it mm-hmm. is this part right here. Okay, I'm going to read it to you. Okay. Um, so basically you have your main character, the kid. He floats into a room where he meets the commander of the ship that he's on. And the commander's sitting behind a desk. And the thing that he notes about this guy is that he's ripped. He's like Ooh. really muscly. Okay. Uh, but he's sitting behind a desk. So it says... <laughs> When he had finished writing all this down and adding many notes that I would have given a good deal to read, Commander Doyle laid aside the old-fashioned fountain pen he was using and stared at me for a minute as if I was some peculiar animal. He drummed thoughtfully on the desk with his huge fingers, which looked as if they could tear their way through the material without much trouble. I was feeling a bit scared. And to make matters worse, I drifted away from the floor and was floating helplessly in midair again. There was no way I could move anywhere unless I made myself ridiculous by trying to swim, which might or might not work. The commander gave a chuckle, and his face crinkled up into a vast grin. I think this may be quite amusing, he said. While I was still wondering if I dared to ask... Why, he continued after glancing at some charts on the wall behind him. Afternoon classes have just stopped. I'll take you to meet the boys. Then he grabbed a long metal tube that must have been slung underneath the desk and launched himself out of his chair with a single jerk of his huge arm. He moved so quickly that it took me completely by surprise. A moment later, I just managed to stifle a gasp of amazement. For as he moved clear of the desk... I saw that Commander Doyle had no legs. Oh. And I remember that image so vividly because it was just like this realization of like, dude, like, you don't have any legs and you're in space and you live and you work in space where there's no gravity. You're at an advantage. Yeah. To everyone around you. If they have legs. It's like a perfect thing for him to do. Exactly. And... It's cool, too, because then I won't read the whole thing, but he gets into later about he describes space suits. And he says that, like, when you think of a space suit, you probably think of, like, a diving bell or, like, what we think of when we look. Right. He basically describes what space suits became. Yeah. But he says that, no, they would be like an egg with arms that you could put your arms through. Yeah. But, like... Basically, his point was that, like, there's there's no need for legs in space. Okay. <laughs> so, like, the bottom, like, you would just have your legs in, like, the sitting, like, cross-legged inside this oh, that little that floating. I get, his really point is that it's only for a zero G. He's like, you do need legs, obviously, to walk <laughs> around on the moon or Mars. Right. But if you're floating around doing EVAs, you don't need legs. Like, there's no reason. So. This is true. I thought it was pretty cool. That is cool. Yeah. You need a lot of effing help. When you're in space from whatever ship you're in to live. It is amazing. Sometimes I think and I I have the same um, outlook that you have that you just stop and you're just like, it's so crazy. It's so crazy, crazy. dude, to even think that we would even try it. Yeah. It is. I I mean, it's every episode is going to be me going. It's just crazy. (laughs) Can you believe it? (laughs) I do think it's weird. Did he like, what is Arthur C. Clarke's like background? Um, He's a physicist, uh, an astronomer, okay. a scientist. He he was in, he fought in World War II. Do you want to know what he did literally predict? What? It's a thing that you probably didn't even know existed, but it's, what? <laughs> we don't need it anymore. But so he predicted the geostationary satellite communication which is no, basically <laughs> so okay so if i want to send a radio wave to china yeah i can't because the earth solid rock earth is between me and china right mm-hmm. so what he described and then what what actually became real 
is geostationary satellites, which means that it's a satellite that is revolving around the earth at the same speed that the earth spins. Hmm. So it stays above the same spot. Oh, wow. So basically, so if you have one above the U S these are going to be total guesses, but one above the U S one above Africa and one above Asia, then if I want to say something to like, Africa basically so you send your radio signal up to that satellite and then the satellite sends it down to the other side of the planet get it yeah so that he described it in a paper and then it became a real thing that's cool yeah so I mean it's just crazy that he like knew all this stuff I agree why do you think I'm obsessed with him and I started a podcast about him well like did people did he give people these ideas or like did he get these ideas from other people and then they just like were these things like scientists were talking about i don't know about all of them but i'm sure it's a mixture of all for instance uh, dude it's like the there was a space shuttle called discovery yeah in real life it's it's called discovery because the spaceship in 2001 is called discovery oh so like it's a it's like a back and forth. It's like a right. mutual respect. You right. know what I mean? Um and then like so two thousand one A Space Odyssey, the movie was written by Arthur C. Clarke. Mm-hmm. And that movie came in nineteen sixty eight. <clears throat> the moon landing occurred in nineteen sixty nine. Um and the soundtrack to two thousand one is very iconic. Yeah. And I s like astronauts back in the day were allowed to bring one cassette tape into space with them yeah and some of them would bring like the music from that movie that's crazy because that movie just is so like goes just hand in hand with like real space travel huh so i mean i could totally be more knowledgeable about arthur c clark but what's the c stand for do we know wow you got me charles (laughs) arthur charles clark I, I don't know. I mean, it is pretty cool. I like the way that Arthur C. Clarke sounds. We're going to have to figure this out. We're All doing right. it, taking a Google break. We get it. <laughs> Are you just writing, what does the C and Arthur C. Clarke stand for? Let's Charles. See. I was right. Oh, Chuck. And he's a sir. He's a sir? Does that mean he's a knight? He's knighted? I don't know. I guess. Sir Arthur I think it C. Clarke. He's knighted. All right, <clears throat> let's. Uh, I just have a few more sections from the book that I want to bring attention to. Okay. Okay. Here we go. You'll like this, Heather. Maybe this will be a reason why you'd go to space. Hmm. Let's see. What have we here? Okay. So, little Roy, little sixteen-year-old Roy. Okay. And his little mischievous buddies, <clears throat> they decide to. <laughs> there's like. There's a bunch of spaceships like in the same orbit, like, and some of them are like not used anymore. Okay. But they're just floating. Yep. So one of them, like the boy, him and his little buddies, like the the little buddies use it as like a hangout spot, like one of the ships. I don't think they're supposed to go there, but they go anywhere. <laughs> okay. So they bring Roy, and when they get there, this is what they find. Oh boy. All right. So <clears throat> this is the scene where the the kid. And his buddies go over to the spaceship that they're like not really supposed to be messing around in. And this is what happens. What's the fuss? Carl replied, still as calm as ever. You nearly blew in my eardrums. We didn't help matters by shouting our own queries. And it was some time before Tim restored order. Stop yelling, everybody. Now, Peter, tell us exactly what you found. I could hear Peter give a sort of gulp as he collected his breath. This ship is full of guns, he gasped. Honest, I'm not fooling. I can see about 20 of them clipped to the walls. And they're not like any guns I've ever seen before. They've got funny nozzles and they are red and green cylinders fixed beneath them. I can't imagine what they're supposed to... Carl, Tim demanded. Is Peter pulling our legs? No, came the reply. It's perfectly true. I don't like to say this, 
but if there are such things as ray guns, we're looking at them now. So what do you think's going on? I don't know. I, why? I don't know. Clark doesn't like to leave his uh, readers in much suspense. A mere two pages later. When we got to the bottom of it, the whole mystery had an absurdly simple explanation. 21st century were going all out to make a real epic, the first interstellar and not merely interplanetary film. And it was going to be the first feature film to be shot entirely in space, without any studio faking. Pretty cool, huh? That, so that was going to happen, or it still is going to happen? Like, when they mean? went to it, it it was a film that had been abandoned? No, like, they ferried up all the props. Oh, okay. And then the crew and the actors were on their way. Oh, and that's so cool. Just, yeah. And like these kids just have access to it. <laughs> well, then, well, the... What I left out was the crew coming onto the ship. Oh. So they're basically, like, hiding thinking these are like space pirates oh, like bad people yeah. with guns but it turns out it's just a film crew mm. and um so then like the next like whatever couple of chapters is the boys get hired to work as like lighting people like <laughs> like to help them what? oh my god well because one of the things they go through in the book is how like it takes a little while to get used to moving around in zero g so these crew members who've never filmed a movie in space are like yeah. fumbling around. Oh jeez. <laughs> so the boy the boys are like let us do that for you. Well, that's something that is probably a wrong prediction. Yes. Yeah, like, he didn't predict CGI. They would never. Yeah. <laughs> make it way easier. Even if we could. Yeah. People would be like no. <laughs> yeah, no. Fo- yeah, dude, the the um like dude, he Clark just imagines like this perfect little world, dude. It's like the insurance Oh, I was just gonna say. Just to I was, I was to just gonna say, money does not exist <laughs> yeah. in Arthur C. Clarke's yeah. world. <laughs> Could right. you imagine? Also, laws don't exist because if you <laughs> were a film crew and some kids, you were just like, "Oh, why don't you work the lights?" Like right. that would be against like some child oh, yeah. labor laws. <laughs> All right. Um, one thing Clark has created, at least in this trilogy, is there is life in our solar system besides us. So a big part of the Sands of Mars is about, first of all, in the Sands of Mars, when they get, like before humans ever get to Mars, there's vegetation, okay, which is not obviously true. Yeah. Um, but the main character discovers little Martians oh. while he's there. They're little? Well, they're described <laughs> as like fat little kangaroos. Oh, okay. So they, they're like, ch- they're like round and they hop. And they have like floppy ears, big eyes, and a beak. And um, they basically, I mean, so so it's just interesting that like my little theory of this connected universe kind of works because at yeah. one point at the end of this novel, they mention Martians, and but they don't go into any detail. But what they do say about these Martians could be the Sands of Mars Martians. I'm not, okay. I'm not saying they are, but they could be. But now in this novel. Clark goes even further. Like, okay, so you got a cute little Martian kangaroo. Okay, big Aww. deal. Who cares? They name it Squeak. It's the worst name you could ever name yeah, an that's alien. Pretty lame. It's so stupid. <laughs> um, but in this one, oh, so so you basically learn how Commander Doyle lost his legs, and it how it happened was he goes on the first manned mission to Mercury. Okay, you, what do you know about Mercury? I don't know anything about it, really. In what order does it appear outward from the sun? Oh, it's first. Yes. Yeah. Very nice. Oh, it's hot. Very hot. Because legs burned off. Hot, hot, hot. No, he (laughs) doesn't. But um, so Mercury is one of those planets where one face is always facing the sun. Oh, God. So there's a permanently cold side and a permanently hot side. And then there's what you call the twilight zone, which is the middle part which is the only part that wouldn't be too hot or too cold to just like do a little exploration. Okay. 
So you have to chill in that line. The Twilight Zone? That's really what it's called? That's what Clark called it. I don't know. Um, it's creepy. So he's in the Twilight Zone. And, and basically, like, he just describes this this world of, like, like, so there's mountains. And at one point, they land their spaceship just to do, like, some, like, readings or whatever of just like the surrounding rock and stuff Mm -hmm. and every night the guy looks through a telescope at this mountain and at one point he sees something move oh so they get in their little suits and they head over there and they find life on mercury and what it is is it's an eight foot tall basically spider so it's what? like, so, and they say at first they say, so like the night side of Mercury is like freezing, freezing, freezing. Like, like you couldn't survive as a human even for a second. Okay. So these creatures, right? The ground they walk on is so cold that they have four, they have two separate sets of four legs. So when it's walking on its four legs and then when those get too cold, they envelop them oh. into their body and the other four come out. Arlo would like that. Yeah. It's too cold for him to walk around outside. more legs. He needs more legs. <laughs> That's a really super cool idea. Yeah. It's but super- it also sounds really creepy. Yeah. Hell yeah. There it is. He yelled. By that cliff over there. We just stood and stared. And I had my first good look at a Mercurian. It was more like a giant spider than anything else. Or perhaps one of those crabs with long spindly legs. Its body was a sphere about a yard across and was a silvery white. At first we thought it had four legs, but later we discovered that there were actually eight, a reserve set being carried tucked up close to the body. They were brought into action when the incredible cold of the rocks began to creep too far up the thick layers of insulating horn which formed its feet or hooves. When the Mercurian got cold feet, it switched to another pair. It also had two handling limbs, which at the moment were busily engaged in searching among the rocks. They ended in elaborate horny claws or pincers, which looked as if they could be dangerous in a fight. There was no real head, but only a tiny bulge on the top of the spherical body. Later, we discovered that this housed two large eyes for use in the dim starlight of the night land and two small ones for excursions in the more brilliantly illuminated twilight zone, the sensitive large eyes then being kept tightly shut. We watched, fascinated, while the ungainly creature scuttled among the rocks, pausing now and again to seize a specimen and smash it to powder with those efficient-looking claws. Then something that might have been a tongue would flash out too swiftly for the eye to follow, and the powder would be gobbled up. What do you think it's after? asked Borel. That rock seems pretty soft. I wonder if it's some kind of chalk. Hardly, I replied. It's the wrong color, and chalks only form at the bottom of seas anyway. There's never been free water on Mercury. Shall we see how close we can get? said Glenn. I can't take a good photo from here. It's an ugly looking beast, but I don't think it can do us any harm. It'll probably run a mile as soon as it sees us. I gripped the flare pistol more firmly and said, Okay, let's go, but move slowly and stop as soon as it spots us. We were within a hundred feet before the creature showed any signs of interest in us. Then it pivoted on its stock like legs, and I could see its great eyes looking at us in the faint moon glow of Venus. Glenn said. Shall I use the flash? I can't take a good picture in this light. I hesitated, then told him to go ahead. The creature gave a start as the brief explosion of light splashed over the landscape, and I heard Glenn's sigh of relief. That's one picture in the bag anyway. Wonder if I can get a close-up. No, I ordered. That would certainly scare it or annoy it, which might be worse. I don't like the look of those claws. Let's try and prove that we're friends. You stay here and I'll go forward. Then it won't think that we're ganging up on it. Well, I still think that was a good idea, but I didn't know much about the habits of Mercurians in those days. As I walked slowly forward, the creature seemed to stiffen. 
like a dog over a bone. And for the same reason, I guessed, it stretched itself up in its full height, which was nearly eight feet, and then began to sway back and forth slightly, looking very much like a captive balloon in a breeze. Come back, advised Burrell. It's annoyed. Better not take any chances. What happens is they do something to, like, frighten the creature, Mm -hmm. and it it throws a rock at him, and it punctures his suit below the waist, and so his legs basically freeze. Oh, God. And so I think maybe I can find the last line of this paragraph, or of this section. So he has to get them amputated? Well, he says, let me see. Well, we made it somehow, though I don't remember ever entering the ship. When I came back to consciousness, we were on our way back to Earth, but my legs were still on Mercury. What? Pretty crazy. It froze right off. I don't know. Maybe they smashed him off with a hammer or something. Oh, God. Well, don't you, like, lose, if you get frostbite, like, yeah, your fingers fall off or something? Yeah, and I think this is happening on Mercury. It happens at like a much faster rate. Yeah, you just, one second, you got legs, the next okay. you don't. So this, I'm almost done with this novel. Like, there's, I don't have a, I don't have a whole lot to say about this novel. Like, some Clark novels are just very, they're just straightforward, man. It's just like what you see is what you get. Like, like I said, it's just a tour of like spaceships seen through the eyes of this little six-year-old boy who loves space. Mm-hmm. And then at the end of the novel, he just goes home. Okay. So, but you were asking about gravity in space, right? So this is an inter- interesting thing. This is a concept. I don't know if Clark invented this concept, but it first became popular through him, through the novel, but more so the movie 2001, as to how you have gravity in space, right? So he explains it in this novel. This is the boy Roy narrating. He says, When I had dressed, I started to explore my new surroundings. The first thing I had to get used to was the fact that the floors were all curved. Of course, I also had to get used to the idea that there were floors anyways, after doing without up and down for so long. The reason for this was simple enough. I was now living on the inside of a giant cylinder that slowly turned on its axis. Centrifugal force the same force that held the station in the sky was acting once again, gluing me to the side of the revolving drum. If you walk straight ahead, you could go right round the circumference of the station and come back to where you started. At any point, up would be toward the central axis of the cylinder, which meant that someone standing a few yards away, farther round the curve of the station, would appear to be tilted toward you. Yet to them, everything would be perfectly normal, and you would be the one who was tilted. It was confusing at first, but like everything else, you got to get used to it after a while. The designers of the station had gone in for some clever tricks of decoration to hide what was happening. And in the smaller rooms, the curve of the floor was too slight to be noticed. Huh. So did you get that? Well, is it turning or not? Yeah, it's spinning. It is spinning. Okay. But if you're inside it and you there's like no windows, you wouldn't know that it was spinning. Yeah. That's weird. So if you spin, it's the same. I mean, the if you take like a bucket of water and you spin, oh, yeah. it the water doesn't come out. That's right. So it's the same, um, the same concept. Right. Is that if you spin it, like you're basically like, forced against the walls and so if the wall then is your floor then you're standing to but it you, seems like upright. you could know you noticed it what do you mean like how was the room shaped it was a tube it's a yeah it's a cylinder so you're pressed up against the inside of the cylinder okay but you're walking yeah it's like normal earth gravity that's weird and depending on how far away from the center you are, this mm-hmm. is all explained in this book, depending on how far away from the center you are is how much gravity there will be. Oh. Like if you're closer to the middle, there's less gravity. If you're okay. further out, there's more gravity. That's confusing. So, so in the novel, basically it's it's there for like if you're, if you're in space for a long time, you come to this uh, 
this cylinder. Yep. And you start at the at the closest level to the middle mm-hmm. to get your body used to having oh, any yeah. weight at all. And then you move to the second level, and then you move to the third level, and the third level is simulated Earth gravity. Oh. So that you can be prepared for when right. you finally come back and you don't like crumple under oh, God. the gravity of Earth. So that's, again, the reason I brought it up is because like, it's, like this concept is so ingrained in science fiction now, and Clark made it famous. What we is? We cannot forget this. It's in the midnight sky. What? A spinning thing creates oh, gravity. Oh, oh. So did you notice in the midnight sky how there would occasionally be shots of them floating and like yeah. up that ladder? That was cool. So that is the middle part. Yep. And so th- like this is here and there's another one here. And if you're here, you're spinning so you have gravity. Yep. But to get from here to the one over here, you have to go through where there's no gravity. It was cool how they just like push themselves along. Yeah. And like... And it's it's heavily featured in Interstellar. It's just like it's a concept that like Clark put out there, and huh. and and it has just become this like this like accepted truth yeah. of how we're going to live in space. Yeah. And yet, at the same time, I don't know if we've ever actually tried to do it. Everyone who lives know. in space is just in zero g, right? For us now. Um. Okay, and I just want to read one more thi- one more little thing for you. Okay. From here about it just really hammers home like um what is a space dreamer? Okay. And how Roy is 100% a space dreamer. Um So, basically Commander Doyle, yep. The um guy with no legs. Yes, he basically says to our main character Roy he's like look Roy I know you're going back down to earth I know you love it up here he said you seem to handle yourself pretty well in space if in a couple years when you're old enough you want to come work up here I'll put in a letter of recommendation and you can come work up here with me in this space station in this place that you love and he says and I knew that after all I was going to disappoint Commander Doyle The space stations were too near home to satisfy me now. My imagination had been captured by that little red world glowing bravely against the stars. When I went into space again, the interstation would only be the first milestone on my outward road from Earth. that's cool right yeah how good is that though dude really like and that's not even that good for clark (laughs) in terms of just like language yeah like when i went into space again the interstation would only be the first milestone on my outward road from earth outward road from earth yeah i want to be on that road dude (laughs) later Yeah, I mean, I think Roy sounds lucky. He got to go up to that and get a taste. He got to get a taste for it. That's right. And in turn, we as the readers get a taste. Yeah. Which is why I love Clark. Yeah. So what else? So the word Martian comes from Mars. Yeah. So that's weird. Have we named any other... Well, I, aliens after other planets. In the novel, he calls the creature, yeah, a, the spider, a Mercurian. A Mercurian. Okay. I think of from Venus is a Venetian or Venuvi. Ven, there's some word for someone from Venus. Okay. And Neptunian. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Ju- Jupi- Jupiterite. Saturnian. Yeah, I, don't I don't know. know. Well. Um, yeah, I was just thinking about that because I feel like Martian is like, at this point is basically just another word for alien. Yeah, for sure. I was thinking like, why do we think, why, why do we do that? Just because Mars is like most likely to have, I think man life on it. Yeah. I think it was the first planet to be discovered from like people way back in the day of shitty telescopes. Okay. So we've all, for a long time, humanity has been dreaming about 
the red planet. Yeah. And just wondering what's going on up there. Yeah. Um, but uh, I mean, I guess I'll give like a, maybe I already did this, but like, I think this, this is a good, it's good to look at like the first three novels of as kind of like their own thing. Like I said, Clark was like getting his literary feet underneath him. Mm -hmm. He was kind of figuring out how to write a novel and balance like his scientific knowledge with his, his ability to write in like a poetic way about profound things. Yeah. Um, and then the, what it all leads up to is episode four, where we're going to be talking about what is widely considered Clark's best novel. And even more so than the ultra famous 2001. Mm-hmm. Um, I read, and the novel's called Childhood's End. Okay. The fourth novel he wrote. Mm-hmm. It, it like won the most awards. It, it Again, most people consider it his best novel. And it yeah. is... From memory, it, I read it for the first time only two years ago. It is such a leap in storytelling and just and just these like gorgeous imagery and like all these metaphors for humanity and and all these amazing things that happen in Childhood's End. It's like it's such a great novel and it's so much more profound than like little Roy yeah. floating around and like helping a movie crew. Right. It's like it, it, you, episode four and the fourth novel is really going to take us into like true Arthur C. Clarke, like like his his true brilliance and his and his real talent. He he he, he came out of his shell for Childhood's End, basically. I guess you could say. Yeah. So, if you've made it this far into this podcast, you should one hundred percent check out episode four, or don't even check out episode four. Just read Childhood's End. And hit me up on Instagram, the Space Dreamers, T H E S P A C E D R E A M E R S. Hit me up. Let's talk about childhood's end. Who are the children? And, Why uh, is their childhood ending? Yeah. Are there no more children and only adults? What? <laughs> no, that's children of men. <laughs> Different sci fi novel. <laughs> Have you ever read that book? No. It's so good. I haven't. I like the movie, but I haven't read the book. The movie's incredible. It's, yeah, it's pretty different from the movie, but it's good. Um, yeah. You know what's weird? Okay, can I say before we wrap this up one yes. weird, weird thing about that novel? Sure. Okay, it's written by a woman named P.D. James. Okay. okay. This lady has never written a, has has not published a single novel that is not a freaking murder mystery, and then all of a sudden. In the middle of her bibliography is the fucking children of men. It's amazing, dude. It's just real different for her. Yeah. and But it's not just that it's different. It's like, it's a really good book. Huh. And it's straight up a, like apocalyptic science fiction. But none of her other books are like that? Nope. They're all murder mysteries. Murder mysteries like, can be good. Quaint little London or uh, like English countryside murder mysteries. Huh. Very strange. That's interesting. Got got to give it up to her though. That that book's really good. Um Okay, so I already gave I already shouted out my Insta. <laughs> <laughs> uh and I already said that y'all should tune in for episode 4. And like I said, man, DM me. Let me know if you've read these ACC books. Yeah. And like I'll get you on the show. That's cool. You have some kind of other opinion about Solaris? Let's break it down. Oh, I know, right? Yes. Or evolution. Tell us what you think. If you haven't seen evolution, get on it. So my <laughs> friend, my friend who makes the music for this podcast, yeah. I post I posted a picture of evolution on my Instagram. Yeah. And he messaged me. He's just like, dude, evolution is an amazing movie. And I was like, dude, I know. Yeah. You know, it's funny because here we are being like, if you haven't seen it and I feel like I in general have seen more movies than most people and so I spend a lot of time going like, have you seen this movie? Have you seen this movie? And most of the time the answer is no. <laughs> I feel like a lot of people had have seen Evolution. Like people do like that movie yeah. and have seen it. it so yeah. I don't know. Maybe it's just in that time frame or I mean, something. Sh- that was like when Sean Williams got was yeah. pretty big. 
But also maybe part of it too is just that that was still like there's so many movies to watch now. So I feel like right. a lot of times people are like, oh, I just, you know, it's too overwhelming. But yeah, that could very well be the only science fiction movie that came out that year. You really never yeah. know. I I mean, I don't know. But also maybe more people could see it because it was a PG-13 movie, like True. you said. So, yeah. I don't know. It's right. a good one, though. Well, I guess that wraps it up. I was going to try to keep this bad boy under two hours. We are at two hours and two minutes. Oh, boy. So that about does it. Thank okay. you for joining us. <laughs> Thank you for having me. You are welcome. <laughs> All right, that's it. <laughs> Thank you for joining us once again for another episode of the Space Dreamers podcast. It gives me immense pleasure to bring this content to you. Uh, Before I let you go, however, I need to thank my gracious co-host, Heather, for joining me and listening to my mad ravings about Solaris. Uh, I also have to give a massive shout-out to Kevin Lesage for going above and beyond and out of the goddamn atmosphere in making all the music that you heard today in this podcast. Uh, I also need to thank Mallory Wilkins for performing my ads today. And also, last but never least, Quinlan Orleans Aikens, the one and only, my voiceover artist, for reading all the passages from Islands in the Sky. Now, I cannot stress enough the importance of tuning in for episode four. Uh, The first three books by Arthur C. Clarke are solid novels. Uh, They're worth exploring. But he really, really, really found his science fiction literary legs when he wrote his fourth novel childhoods and widely considered his greatest novel i've read it uh it is quite good Uh, i don't know if it's the greatest but it's excellent uh please please join in next time leave me a five-star review leave me a written review if you feel like it please get in touch with me uh dm me leave a like follow me over at instagram at the space dreamers t-h-e S-P-A-C-E-D-R-E-A-M-E-R-S That's it. Thank you again for making it this far. These episodes are kind of long, and you're amazing if you listen to the whole things. All right, thank you so much. Join us next time. Bye-bye. This has been a Sumadre production. See you next time.